Continuing on in, in chapter one, exploring life, we are going to talk more now about um, how uh, the core themes of biology work together and how you go about studying science and learning things from science. Again, focus on the vocabulary terms as they appear in italics. Make sure that you understand the words and their definitions and how to use them. So the core theme of biology is evolution. Okay, that's uh, something that all biology texts nowadays are centered around the, the, uh, the evolutionary concept. Um, life has a unity that is based on DNA because all living things have a common genetic code. Whether you're an amoeba or a bacterium or a human or a lemur or any other kind of organism, a mushroom, the DNA that is found in those cells is the same kind of molecule. Within the DNA, there are a lot of similarities in the um, structure of the molecule, in the, um, there are the, the sequences of the genes that are found. Even if something as diverse as a mushroom and you have some gene sequences that are virtually identical to each other. So the unity of life is based on DNA. D the changes in DNA or the additions or subtractions of DNA leads to diversity within the org within the living things. Okay, and because there are a lot of different kinds of living things, diverse living things, we have to learn some things about taxonomy. We'll spend some time learning about how things are classified, but taxonomy is the science of classification. So we're going to delve into that just a little bit here, so that you can get an idea of where we'll be headed with this. Within all living things, there are three domains, three major huge groups of living things. These are the bacteria, which, uh, which is composed of kingdom eubacteria, which are all prokaryotes. They're very diverse and widespread. When you get a staph infection, that's from a member of kingdom bacteria. But when you have beneficial bacteria in your intestines, like E. coli, that help you digest certain foods and produce certain kinds of minerals, uh, uh, vitamins, I'm sorry, um, those are also members of kingdom eubacteria, domain bacteria. The second domain is domain archaea, which is composed of kingdom archaebacteria. These are also prokaryotes, but these are ones that you don't find commonly uh, in your everyday life. They live in very extreme environments. These are the ones that you find on the bottom of the ocean or living in um, hot springs um, in very high salinity places like the Dead Sea. These are, they live in very, very extreme places. They were probably among the earliest organisms to develop and they're actually the ones that are more closely related to us than the other bacteria. The third domain is the eukarya, which is composed of eukaryotes. <clears throat> Remember, we talked about prokaryotes and eukaryotes being two different kinds of cells. Within domain eukarya, there are four main groups. There is, kingdom, there is uh, protista, which is composed of a number of different kingdoms of different kinds of organisms, mostly unicellular or simple multicellular organisms. The plantae, which are the plants, they are multicellular photosynthetic organisms. The fungi, which are multicellular decomposers, and kingdom animalia, which are multicellular consumers. We'll talk more about these. I'm going to give you a couple of examples on the next slide, but we'll talk a lot more about these in more detail later on after we get into the study of organisms. So here we have <coughs> domain bacteria, which is composed of kingdom eubacteria. This is a common kind of bacteria. This is probably E. coli, which is a common um, um, rod-shaped bacterium that is found in your intestine and intestines of most mammals and a lot of other organisms as well. Very, very common. <coughs> Domain archaea, kingdom archaebacteria, these are less common. Again, they're found usually in very extreme environments. Um, this is a particular kind called a cyanobacterium, which is also photosynthetic. <coughs> and there are some eubacteria that are photosynthetic as well. And then we have domain eukarya, which, which includes the protists. Um, your book says multiple kingdoms. Um, that's not something that's, that's a relatively new concept, but something that I've been expecting for quite some time because the diversity within the protista are very, very high by diversity, lots of different kinds of things. Kingdom plantae, kingdom, the plants, kingdom fungi, which is like mushrooms and molds and yeasts. Um, and then kingdom animalia, which includes animals and insects and 
birds and mammals and so forth. Lots of different kinds of things. It's necessary to have a way to categorize these things, and that's why we have something called taxonomy, which is the science of classifying and naming things. And we'll spend some time later on this year learning about how that works and how to use it. Evolution is what explains the unity of life and also the diversity of life. The species that are alive today are descended with modification from ancestral species. Remember we talked about those about those um, adaptations that occur uh, or that are found within species. The evolutionary process is called natural selection. What this means is that individuals that have inheritable traits that are the best suited to their environment are more likely to be reproductively successful and pass along those genes, those adaptations to their offspring. Over time, numerous small changes in the population that are caused by this natural selection eventually lead to the alteration of species and new species can evolve as a result of this gradual accumulation of changes. These are small changes over long periods of time and remember evolution is taught we're talking about things that happen in populations here the evolution occurs in populations not in individuals so we're talking about long small changes within a population over long periods of time because of these differences that crop up that are more advantageous than others so here we have the processes that occur in evolution we have heritable variations we also have most species produce a lot more offspring than, than can survive. Turtles produce a lot more eggs than will grow into, in, grow into um, adult turtles. Uh, some of the eggs get eaten. Some of them don't make it from hatching out of the egg to the ocean to swim away. Once they get into the ocean, some are eaten before they have a chance to develop. The natural selection that occurs uh, occurs because of the unequal reproductive success, and that leads to adaptations of populations. Those baby turtles that had the characteristics that were most advantageous to let them get to the ocean and swim around and avoid predators long enough to grow to a huge size are going to be able to pass on those adaptations to their offspring. That's going to give them a higher reproductive success and it's going to lead over time to the adaptation uh, in their population. Here's an example of some inherited traits. We have here some beetles that are different colors. We have gray ones and white ones and black ones, various shades. If they're on a back, dark background, the lighter colored ones are going to be more obvious to the predators, and so that's going to eliminate individuals that have certain traits. The lighter ones are going to get eaten first by the bird. In, f in the following generations, you will find a lower incidence of those lighter colored and a higher incidence of the darker colored because the ones that survived had the darker color and they're the ones that were able to reproduce and pass on their traits to their offspring. You may still have some lighter ones appear, but generally you will have f they will be fewer in number. If the conditions changed and the background that they lived on was became lighter over time, then you would see a change in that over a long uh, over the the later years, you would see a change in the uh, incidence of the lighter colored um, beetles as opposed to the darker ones. Now we learned about all this kind of stuff by taking the process of science and going through the process of scientific inquiry. What we do in science is we make observations. Because of observations we make, we form hypotheses, which are our ideas or our explanations for the observations that we've made and then we test those predictions that we might possibly make. There are a number of processes and you've learned about the scientific method since probably about the second grade so you know quite a bit about the method but we're talking about the process now. Okay so the data is your recorded observations and measurements which, which are a type of observations. There are two main kinds of data. There's quantitative data which is numerical data, whether it's counting something or measuring the length of something or the temperature or so on. And then we have qualitative data that is descriptive. So it might be something about the color or interactions or so forth. Well, using inductive reasoning, we can come up with a hypothesis. Okay, Inductive reasoning is making generalizations from a large number of observations. This is inference. You're inferring what you think will happen based on your past experience or your past observations. 
uh, hypothesis is your proposed explanation for whatever these uh, observations are that you've made. And then you use deductive reasoning to come up with ways to test the hypothesis. Science is about making hypotheses and testing them. Okay, so here we have an observation. We have a flashlight that won't light up. We can come up with two possible hypotheses here. Either the batteries are dead or the bulb is burned out. In our experience, and we've all had past experience with flashlights that don't work, those are the two probable things that, can, that are most likely to cause the light not to work. So how do you figure out which one it is? Well, you make a prediction. If it's dead batteries, then replacing the batteries will fix that problem. If it's the bulb, then replacing the bulb will fix the problem. So your, that's your prediction here, okay? And your experiment is testing your prediction by replacing the batteries or replacing the bulb. If that doesn't work, that falsifies your hypothesis. So in this case, the batteries didn't work, so you have to either revise your hypothesis or propose a new one. If the batteries don't work, usually that's what we try first, then you go to the second hypothesis, which is the burned out bulb. Okay? In this case, the test did not falsify the hypothesis. So now you can make additional predictions and test them. Maybe the light is on, but it's not very bright, so you might need new batteries then. Notice that it says does not falsify hypothesis. It does not say proves the hypothesis. It's very important that you realize that you're not proving a hypothesis. You are developing information, evidence that can support or refute your hypothesis. We're not proving it or disproving it. We are falsifying the hypothesis or we're, we're um, supporting the hypothesis, one or the other. A scientific theory then when we, in science, when we use the word theory, we use it differently than we use in everyday language. In everyday language, oftentimes we use the term theory to mean somebody's idea about something. In science, that's broader in scope. Okay, it's a bigger word. It's broader than a hypothesis, which is somebody's idea about something. A theory is general enough to come up with specific hypotheses that can be tested, and not just one hypothesis, but numerous ones. A scientific theory is supported by a large body of evidence and a growing body of evidence and keep on finding more and more evidence to support it. Theories that become widely adopted are used to explain a lot of different observations and are supported by a huge amount of evidence. So it's a much, much bigger thing. So when we talk about something being a theory, that means a lot more in science than it does in your normal everyday language. The way we test hypotheses is called the scientific method. Hypotheses must be testable and they must be falsifiable. Remember that testing either supports a hypothesis or it refutes it, but it does not prove it or disprove it. We use, in order to test hypotheses, we used controlled experiments. We're going to compare an experimental group with a control group. And that those two groups are going to be different only in the one factor that we're testing in the experiment. It is also important to realize that, that science is very social. Scientists share their results. They try to replicate each other's results. And that can help confirm or refute what's, what is proposed. Um, but we're all, above all, we're looking for natural causes to explain natural phenomena. We're not looking for supernatural kinds of things. We're not looking for off-the-wall kinds of things. We're looking for real-life natural causes for things that occur in the natural world. We will talk a lot about the scientific method. We'll talk about how to go about uh, writing labs and talking about our results of labs and our conclusions and so forth. But a big thing I want you to always remember is that you're not proving or disproving it. So I don't want you to say I was right or my hypothesis was wrong or I made a mistake. Okay, you're talking about supporting the hypothesis or refuting it, not proving it or disproving it. That concludes this part of notes.